And uh, so I say ladies and gentlemen, but also boys and girls, and I see some children here, so it's wonderful to have you all here. Hello. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you all here. And it was is now with a, a, a great sense of this important moment that I call the member for Balmain. Um, thank, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, I start by acknowledging that we meet today on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and that the Balmain electorate where I live and where I work is on the land of both the Gadigal and Wongal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. This land was, is and always will be Aboriginal land. But when I joined the Greens, I never expected to be elected to anything, especially <laughs> the New South Wales Parliament. The Greens may be a small party, but we have a big appetite for change. The Greens offer an alternative vision for how our society can progress based on the four key principles of environmental sustainability, peace, non-violence, grassroots democracy, as well as economic and social justice. And it's these four principles that have guided my work. These principles acknowledge that we live in an interconnected world in which social inequality, abusive human rights and environmental degradation are not separate problems, but the same problem manifested in different ways. And these are the principles that were needed here in the New South Wales Parliament. Principles that my community brought here to the Legislative Assembly in 2011 when they made history electing me as the first ever Greens member in this place. Now, some, admittedly not very kind people, called it a fluke. But since then, not only have I been re-elected twice, but the Greens, along with our four principles, are now represented in this place, the House of Government, by the member for Newtown and the member for Ballina. While I didn't join the Greens to win a seat in Parliament, we did, and we have continued to grow, allowing me to serve my community, which has been the privilege of my life. I didn't come from a political dynasty or a family of great means. Our family was built around dockyards and harbours, as Balmain was, but politics was all around us. My father, uh, he was a tradesman, a fitter, who worked in the confined space of a ship's engine room when he sailed into Sydney Harbour as a merchant sailor. My mother was a daughter, daughter of a proud dock worker from Liverpool in England. I remember vividly the stress experienced by my family when my father was on strike. Each day rolled by with the uncertainty of no income, but the determination to achieve a fair go for himself, his family and his workmates. From those times, I gained a real insight into power and the sacrifices that people made to win positive change. It helped me understand how power works and how when people well organised can act as a counterweight to those injustices, both social and environmental. These ideas which formed during my upbringing were confirmed and reinforced intellectually during my undergraduate and postgraduate studies, which not coincidentally were in the field of economics. It was these ideas gained from my experience and my studies that led me to stand as a candidate for the Greens for election to Leichhardt Council. In 1999, no Green had ever been elected to that council, and there were only a few Greens councils across Australia. But I stood to get important community issues on the political agenda and was surprised to win the election to represent the Balmain Ward. I served as the lone Greens councillor by myself for four years, and then in 2004, four Greens were elected to that council, and in 2008, six were elected, and I became the first Greens mayor. I'm so proud of those 12 years and what we achieved, and I learnt a lot from the legacy of former councillors Nick Origlass and Izzy Weiner, as well as the then independent councillor Hall Greenland. And just three years later, Mr Speaker, we had an enormous breakthrough, something we never thought possible. The people of the electorate of Balmain elected me to be the first Green to represent an electorate in the lower house in the history of this parliament. A win, I have to confess, I approached with some trepidation. When I first walked through the doors of the parliament, there was no blueprint. To make my introduction to parliament even more challenging, not only was I on my own in the bear pit, but I missed the induction for new members. <laughs> Why? Because the counting of votes for the seat of Balmain was so tight, I couldn't claim the win and attend the meeting until a full week after the election. In the end, we squeaked over the line by a measly 205 votes. 205. 
I made that number the passcode on the entrance to our office for many years. <laughs> so we could remember every day the mountain we had to climb before the next election. When you are in a marginal seat, it's a sprint every single day. Of course, what I did have was several Green colleagues in the Legislative Council who I relied on for assistance and advice. Having only been a party of the Upper House, we didn't know then that there were many critical differences between the two Houses of Parliament, a key one being question time. In the other place, it's more of a voluntary exercise. Thinking attendance was optional, on my first day in Parliament, I was outside having a quick lunch, only to get a phone call from my alarmed staff saying, um, all the members are in the Parliament. I think you need to be there too for question time. <laughs> I had to sneak, rather obviously, into question time through that side door, my first day on the job. There was also some question amongst the clerks as to my standing in the House, because up until that point, the Legislative Assembly had been exclusively made up of members from the government, from opposition, and a smattering of independents. So when it came to asking a question in the House, the standing orders was, you know, it just indicated those who could be given the call. The members of the government, the members of the opposition, and independent members. And I wasn't any one of them. In fact, no minor party had held a seat in the New South Wales Lower House since 1973. So the Speaker had to introduce uh, a, uh, how can I call it, a procedural statement to account for my presence in this place. <laughs> this First Amendment to take account of the Greens being in the Lower House uh, was the start of more changes in this place. I hope my election helped to dispel that myth that a vote for the party that, well, a lot of people would like to vote for was wasted, that myth that said that it was a wasted vote because they could never win. It's clearly not the case. In the decades since, the power of the major parties has been steadily whittled away as the people of New South Wales have chosen to be represented by more and more diverse political colours. Mr Speaker, I believe this is overwhelmingly a good thing for politics in New South Wales, and I'm sure you would agree as an independent member. <laughs> It's been a good thing for the environment, it's been good for integrity, and it's been good for our communities. When I was elected, it's, I think it's fair to say that I wasn't greeted with open arms by the Labor Party or even by the government. But over time, I think the culture has changed to recognise that other parties have a place here and our views are all valid. Here I want to acknowledge um, the former speaker during those early years, a member for the South Coast, who gave me a fair go. And she defended me from the worst elements of the parliament when I was new, when I was speaking or asking questions. So thank you to you. <laughs> That's it. Um, we imagine, Mr Speaker, that laws made... Uh, they're really developed through a contest of ideas. We hope as much, and we hope that it's about a weighing of evidence, but sadly, they often aren't, at least not always here. Ministers, no matter their colour, often aren't led by the evidence, uh, by experts or the community. They can be led by lobbyists and vested interests. And while lobbyists may not be able to donate as much cash, they are here in the building and they work full time to build relationships with departmental staff and ministers, and that means that they can wield disproportionate influence. We've always also seen that influence peddling in action as ministers leave and then take up lucrative roles in industry. That's why it's so critical the recent recommendations of the ICAC on lobbying should be implemented in full. Yeah. You know, I've seen community organisations forced to jump through endless hoops to secure precarious funding for proven, effective and cost-efficient programs, and then seen ministers somehow snap their fingers and produce millions for marginal seats, um, for stadiums or for a pet project. I think, Mr Speaker, the people of New South Wales deserve better. And just a note on this new political device known as the business case, the most secretive and often very expensive modelling that allows the approval of just about anything. It's a new device that's been introduced um, which leads to a, a, a demand for it to be supported. And, Mr Speaker, it reminds me of the so-called business cases supported amalgamating councils against the wishes of their communities. The projected benefits were wildly inaccurate, but the consultants still march on, charging millions for their must-have justification document that we can then wave at the media and public saying our policy is right. Mr Speaker, when I was elected to Parliament, my top priority was to deliver for my local community. Together, we have shown without doubt that members in this place can deliver results despite not being in government. I was so proud to have negotiated changes to the laws proposed by the government concerning Callum Park, 
and my amendments passed by the parliament, and I want to acknowledge Minister Stokes, protected Callum Park from privatisation and exploitation. These new laws come on top of the $14 million secured to restore that magnificent public space of Callum Park, ensuring a bright future for this jewel of the inner west. Mr Speaker, we also changed the state's constitution. Our bill, now law, allows parliament to meet virtually during a crisis such as a pandemic. It means an end to the running of the state by the executive during a crisis and empowers us as members of parliament to allow our democracy to continue to operate in a crisis. This critical check and balance is now enshrined by, in law. This was the only non-government bill opposed by the government, but actually supported by most members, um, that passed the parliament since my almost 12 years here. And it's a clear sign of what negotiations in good faith can achieve and what the Greens can deliver in Parliament. We've seen in our, my local community the revitalisation, not the demolition, of the White Bay Power Station and $14 million invested in its upgrade, which I hope will soon become an iconic cultural and community space for all of Sydney to enjoy. We've driven the successful campaign that secured $60 million for shorter ship power at White Bay after the former government made that terrible decision to locate a cruise ship terminal just metres from people's homes. We've helped make the largest fleet of electric buses anywhere in the country live in the electorate of Balmain at the Leichhardt Bus Depot. And right nearby, the Lilyfield to Dulwich Hill Light Rail, a successful campaign which I helped lead during my time on Leichhardt Council. I was also pleased to gain the support of the parliament to secure an amendment which delivered $50 million for green hydrogen projects, the first investment of its kind in New South Wales. And with the support of the community, we've won a Glebe Ferry and a new school for Ultimo. Now, Mr Speaker, many of my biggest achievements have been stopping bad ideas from seeing the light of day. The details of these machinations, however, will have to be left for another time. I know that's all the good stuff, but there's still people who are in this place. It'll be in the book later on. Uh, you know, Mr Speaker, this does prove that you don't have to be in government to deliver good results and represent your community. You can be an effective advocate for your area from the crossbench. And apart from these bigger ticket items, I've been so proud to deliver that, the, the grant funding worth many millions to small community groups through community building partnership and other programs for our community. And most importantly, Mr Speaker, and most proudly, I've been able to speak up for people who often don't have a voice, especially for our social housing community, helping residents with everything from filling out forms to getting a new roof or their kitchen repaired. I've also been so proud to be able to act as a voice for many communities in New South Wales who need support and solidarity, like our friends here today from the Kurdish community, the people of Myanmar and the Sahrawi people of Western Sahara. I've tried to help these communities to have a place in parliament so their calls for justice can be heard. Beyond these issues, members will know I've been keenly focused on matters of integrity in government. The investigative work of the ICAC has claimed two premiers dismantled the upper ranks of the former Labor Ministry and dismissed pretty much a cricket team of Liberal MPs. I've defended the ICAC from political attacks from pretty much all sides, pushed for independent funding for better protections for anti-corruption whistleblowers and stronger anti-corruption laws to ensure crooked politicians are actually convicted. And the good news is that working together, we've had successes in just about every one of these areas and I acknowledge the role of all members in that area. Now, Mr Speaker, I was delighted to be appointed to the Parliamentary Committee for the Independent, Against Corruption, the Independent Commission Against Corruption. And it took me eight years to get on that committee, Mr Speaker, but after eight years, um, my work there over many years has been really some of my most fulfilling. It's been a fascinating insight and it's been a real honour to be able to be part of that committee that oversights the ICAC and ensures that we have a strong corruption fighter in our state. I just want to take this opportunity to commend ICAC and all of those who have taken a stand for integrity, which we all know can often come at a great personal cost. And now, Mr Speaker, to the thank yous. I want to thank all the members of Parliament who have worked so collaboratively to make these things possible for the people of Balmain and the state. I want to, in particular, thank the members that are here tonight to hear this valedictory. It's not compulsory, so to have anyone come, apart from my colleague, the member for Newtown, is actually a win. So I, wa I, want, to, uh, I want to acknowledge that for more years. Um, I also want to mention, and I know a lot of ministers, parliamentary staff are here, um, and I won't mention any names because it might do you more harm than good, but I want to mention those ministers, you know who you are, those MPs 
and the hardworking staff who have done so much for my community and supported me and the issues that I've raised. I also want to acknowledge the various leaders of the House who over the years I've come to know and with a few rare moments and exceptions have always been even-handed and treated me with respect. I also want to thank the Labor MPs, their leaders and staff. I won't mention them, of course, again, because it may, as I mentioned, cause more harm than good. But I want to acknowledge those who have worked really collaboratively with me, very closely behind the scenes, and who have worked to get good outcomes. Here, I want to pause and thank my friends, the independent colleagues on the crossbench, the member for Sydney, uh, the member for Wagga Wagga, who I know is here, the member for Wagga Wagga, and acting as the chair, uh, the member for Lake Macquarie. Um, they have been great supporters, great advocates, and they're people who um, really are outstanding members. I also want to acknowledge the members on the crossbench from the Farmers, Shooters and Fishers Party, that they're passionate, also the passionate and effective independent member for Murray. And I have to mention the latest addition to the crossbench, Tanya Mihalik, the member for Bankstown, who I believe is a person of great integrity, who has now moved to the crossbench. Of course, the work we do in this place is only ever as good as the work that happens behind the scenes with our staff. I couldn't do this job without them and I've been so fortunate to rely on the skills, the wisdom and the energy and fortitude of a small cohort of committed full-time staffers over the years, including Fiona Byrne, Alison Martin, Gemma Pitcher, Madeline Lush, Adam Taylor, Lisa Delow, Alicia Yeo, uh, Louise Stewart, Parissa Zand and Sharon Button. I know many of those former staff are here today. Thank you so much for your commitment over the years. And while I can't mention you all, I want to thank the staff who also acted as short-term relief and who have been so effective in contributing to the work. I want to acknowledge my current team who are all here this evening, David Lewis, Anastasia Radivesca, Ned Kutcher and Eleanor Nurse, who's actually added to my speech the best staffer I've ever had. Um, <laughs> so thank, so thank, you, thank you, Eleanor, for that, that very subtle addition. Um, I'm waiting for any other traps in the speech now. I'm like, what else am I going to say? <laughs> I feel an immense sense of gratitude, really genuinely, to be able to work with them all. I know this feeling is echoed by my constituents, who are full of praise for this team and the huge contribution they've made to the lives of people. I've also been blessed by a cohort of people who have chosen the Bowman office to volunteer or intern. And I knew I had been here maybe too long when a journalist, I won't say who that is, approached me to say they'd done their work experience in my office. And I've been lucky to count on the advice of several great political minds and a band of truly dedicated supporters who have worked so tirelessly. I'm proud that our support has grown over the years and it's a testament to these volunteers to the extent that our margin is now 10%. And I was proud that in the last election we won the vote in every polling station in the electorate, from booths dominated by public housing voters to the wealthiest areas and everything in between. I want to thank the Greens councils who have assisted me during my time in Parliament on both the City of Sydney, Leichhardt Council in the West and special thanks to the former mayor of both Leichhardt and in the West, Councillor Rochelle Porteous. And of course, most importantly, to all of the Greens members and volunteers who have made everything possible. Special mention to the current and former conveners of the local groups and all of those office bearers. Now, there's so many community organisations I could thank, but the list would be far too long. I intend on holding a community event next year when I can focus on all those groups and individuals. But I want to really extend my thanks as well to parliamentary staff who keep this place going, all the folks at Hansard, the people at Cafe Quorum, and all the cleaning staff, everyone who helps make our democracy work. Every member in their valedictory, Mr Speaker, acknowledges their families because they pay the price for our work and because it's one of the few things that all of us members can agree on, that it's our families that carry the burden. The missed birthdays, the late nights, the short weekends, the lack of time, and having to share me with every local resident who wants to just mention their issue very quickly. <laughs> right, just, just for five minutes. <laughs> just in the cafe, in the park, in the restaurant, walking down the street, just five minutes. Um, I want to say thank you to my family, most importantly to my father Richard, my mother Pamela, my brother Jonathan, and my sisters Rebecca and Jacqueline and their husbands, uh, Musi and Ehab. I want to thank my wonderful partner, Shelley, and my delightful daughter, Beatrix, who just turned four on Monday, who I think is having a little lay down. A little rest, there she is. <laughs> I'm so pleased that they're here in the gallery tonight and hope that you are proud of all the work that I've done with all that time that was spent away from you all. To my Greens colleagues in the Legislative Council, Abigail Boyd, Kate Fairman, Sue Higginson, along with all those who came before me, thank you so much for all of the incredible work that you do. 
There's nothing like the solidarity, friendship and unconditional support I've received from the member for Ballina and the member for Newtown, my lower house colleagues. Having them here is all the more powerful, knowing that what it was like to do it by myself for four years. And it's great to have someone to second uh, my calls. <laughs> Thank you to the member for Ballina, who could not be here with us. She's um, fallen ill with COVID. Um, but I want to thank her. She's watching from home. She's one of those remarkable, compassionate, caring people who warms the room when she enters it. She's thoughtful, generous and ex exudes such wisdom and insight. And to the member from Newtown, uh, the most sensible member, which is actually a bit of, a, a bit of an in-joke there, um, no one wants to kind of squeeze um, more out of this place than Jenny. She's so brave. She's tenacious. She's passionate and thoughtful, and the standard she walks past is the standard she accepts, and I can tell you she doesn't walk past very much. <laughs> and, and I'm so honoured that I've had both of these members with me for these now almost eight years, and I couldn't have imagined sitting in this place next to anyone else. Mr Speaker, rarely in the history has Parliament led progressive social change. Most often the Parliament has followed, often reluctantly, the will of the people. When Par while Parliament has great powers, I want to recognise that most often it's our local community where genuine leadership happens. Nowhere is this culture of community activism and leadership stronger than in the seat of Balmain. My constituents, they put me here, but they keep me here by being active, engaged, by encouraging me to do more and more and to be better. As my friend Hall Greenland says, there's nothing like the hot breath of the masses on your neck to keep you focused. <laughs> Mr Speaker, it's a strange feeling that other members in their valedictories mention when you choose to move on. It's like a wake where everyone gives you so much praise, but it has the added benefit that I'm alive to hear it. <laughs> so, Mr Speaker, with that, to everyone who is here tonight and to everyone who elected me to represent them, I hope I have lived up to your expectations because I've tried my hardest. And after standing, and I recently counted it, as a candidate in 11 elections, it's time to move on. I've tried to be fair, to listen, to collaborate and be humble. I've tried to be a good ally and to make space for the voices of others. I've always tried to put public interest first. And now, Mr Speaker, it's time to take my leave, to say thank you and good night.